Wonderful. Good evening, uh, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, special Ascension Day service. We're thankful that we can be here, both members of uh, Trinity Glanbrook and also of Cornerstone. Thankful that we can come together on this special day. We're also very thankful for uh, Dr. John Smith, who will be leading us uh, in worship today. Thank you, Dr. Smith, for being willing to come out on a Thursday evening um, and also to, uh, to uh, praise and glorify the Lord and lead us in this worship. We have one announcement, and that will be uh, we have a collection this evening, and that is for the Streetlight Building Fund. Um, and uh, without any further ado, Dr. Smith. Good evening, brothers and sisters. Please stand to begin this worship service. Congregation, in whom is your help? Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Lift up your hearts to the Lord and receive his greeting. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's now sing as our opening song, uh, hymn 44, the stanzas 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5.
Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, gracious and omnipotent Father, we come before your holy throne this evening to give you great praise and to celebrate your great power over this world. Father, we rejoice in who you are. From the very beginning of this world already, you made all things. And every day again, you care for the world that you have made. You are a God of love who gives us what we need each day again. We thank you for your deep wisdom, wisdom that is far beyond anything that we can imagine. Every day again, you know how much to give and in what proportion, and you give it to us each day again. Also this evening, when we with joy celebrate the ascension of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for the great victory that you gave to your Son, for his triumph over death and over the grave, and how you enthroned him in glory at your right hand, giving to him the throne of his forefather David, seating him in the place of all authority and honor, so that everything in heaven and on earth might bow before him and give him praise. For, Father, all praise is due to you. And so we gather here this evening to give you our praises and our prayers, because that is your just due. And we come here to praise your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, it's a quiet evening, and many in this world don't even think about the ascension of our Savior and his rule in heaven on high. For that, they need to hear the gospel of grace. And so, Father, we pray for your blessing upon that too. Grant that the word of your gospel may continue to go out into this world. We pray also that your work in creation may not go unnoticed. Father, you give us warm weather again, the spring sunshine, a time to plant the crops in the ground. You've given that, Father. And we pray that you would continue to grant favorable weather so that the crops may also grow. For this, too, we look to you and to your gracious hand of giving. Father, we pray that you would bless us now with your Holy Spirit. Receive our praises and our prayers. Open our hearts to understand your word and to rejoice in the blessings that you give. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name alone. Amen. Our scripture reading for this evening is Psalm 134. A Song of Ascents. Come, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands to the holy place and bless the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who made heaven and earth. Let's now also sing this psalm, Psalm 134.
Our text for this evening is taken from the end of the Gospel according to Luke, Luke 24, the verses 50 through 53. Luke 24, verse 50. Then Jesus led his disciples out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, blessing God. Dear congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, this evening we remember the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's one of the great acts of our Savior, important enough to make it into the Apostles' Creed. He ascended into heaven. And yet the Bible is surprisingly brief. There's chapter after chapter about the suffering and death of Christ, but there's only a few verses about his ascension. Matthew's gospel doesn't even mention it. It ends with the Great Commission. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, and I will be with you until the close of the age. So Matthew does not emphasize Christ's departure, but his abiding presence with his disciples. Mark does mention the ascension, but only very briefly, almost as a footnote at the, be at the end of his gospel. It says there, after the Lord had spoken to his disciples, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. That's it, half a verse. And some of the oldest copies of the gospel of Mark don't even have that verse. So then Mark doesn't mention the ascension either. Luke's account has only two verses. The Gospel of John does not describe Christ's ascension either. He only hints at it in chapter 20 where Jesus says to Mary Magdalene, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. So John's gospel ends on the shores of the Sea of Galilee where Jesus had breakfast with his disciples. So to Matthew's gospel, it ends in Galilee. Both of them stop short of the ascension. And what's striking about this is that of the four gospel writers, Matthew and John are the ones who actually saw the ascension happen with their own eyes. They belonged to the 12 apostles and yet they're the ones who leave it out. Maybe this cautions us not to make too much of the ascension. That it happened is important, but exactly how it happened seems less important. The story of the ascension can raise all kinds of questions. How is heaven connected with earth? Can you get to heaven by going up? How is it that Jesus could ascend to heaven, but rockets and shuttles and space probes and telescopes find no evidence for heaven? The biblical accounts of the ascension don't satisfy all our curious questions. The disciples only saw the first part of the ascension until a cloud took Jesus out of their sight. More than that, they did not see. That was all that the Lord wanted them to see. What they had to see was that there would be a change in their relationship with the Lord. No more regular conversations with him. No more meals together. No more instruction. It was time to move on, to enter a new stage of church history. And that's why the disciples had to see him leave with their own eyes. The ascension marks the end of Christ's earthly task and the beginning of his heavenly task. And that's also why Luke records it twice. At the end of his first book, 
and at the beginning of his second book, the book of Acts. I mentioned that exactly how the ascension happened seems to be less important, and yet it's not unimportant. The evangelist Luke does not leave the ascension out, but he describes it in some detail. Where would Luke have gotten those details from? He wasn't there when it happened. But in Luke 1 verse 2, he tells us that he relied on the accounts of eyewitnesses when he wrote his gospel. And that means that he must have heard about the ascension from the apostles themselves. Through the gospel of Luke, the Lord makes sure that the eyewitness testimony of the apostles is preserved for the church. Luke describes the ascension into heaven as a happy occasion. You might have expected that the disciples would be sad to see their master go. But no, we read that they were filled with great joy and that they praised and blessed God continually. Why so happy? Because they had received a blessing from their Savior. They saw him go with arms outstretched. He had ascended, but his blessing descended upon them. And so our theme for this evening is this, Christ leaves a blessing for his church. Or to say it a bit differently, Christ leaves a blessing for his church. Our text begins with the words, he led them out. Christ led his disciples out of Jerusalem. The last time that Christ had gone out of Jerusalem in Luke 23, we do not read that he led but that he was led, together with two criminals, out of Jerusalem to the cross to die. But that was not the end. Here Jesus is again leading his disciples as he had led them so many times before. He leads them out of Jerusalem in the direction of Bethany. That means that they probably walked through the temple area, out of the temple gates, and towards the Mount of Olives. The Lord had traveled that road many times before. He had spent a lot of time in Jerusalem because that was the heart of God's people, the city where God had chosen to dwell, the place where God had put his name, the place where God blessed his people. As we read from Psalm 134, the Lord bless you from Zion. Psalm 134 can help us to understand our text for this evening. It's a song of ascents. And that means that it is a psalm that the people sang when they went up to Jerusalem to offer sacrifices to the Lord. Psalm 134 is the last of the series of songs of ascents. It was probably sung after the people had offered their sacrifices in the temple and were ready to go home again. All that was left for the people to do was to receive the blessing from the priest. The priest would come out to the people, raise his hands, and then speak those familiar words from Numbers 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. That is the scene that Psalm 134 describes. You can divide the psalm into two parts. First, the people call out to the priests. And the people say to the priests, Bless the Lord, you servants of the Lord. Lift up your hands and bless the Lord. And then the priests would respond, the Lord bless you from Zion. And then God's people would leave the temple with joy and they would start the long trip home again. Many of them would take exactly the same road that Jesus now takes with his disciples, eastward, out of Jerusalem, toward the Mount of Olives. And from there the road would branch out in different directions and the people would go their separate ways, some north, some south, some further east. It was a road where people said goodbye. And that is the road where Jesus leads his disciples. His sacrifice, too, is done. And now it's time to say goodbye. 
He leads them out as far as Bethany, says our translation. The Greek actually says as far as towards Bethany. And what that means is as far as the road that leads to Bethany. Jesus led them as far as the Bethany turnoff. Acts 1 actually specifies that they did not go all the way to Bethany, but they only went as far as the Mount of Olives. And there Jesus raised his hands to bless his disciples. Why there? Why not in Jerusalem itself? Doesn't Psalm 134 say, The Lord bless you from Zion? But now the Lord first put some distance between himself and the temple. He walked about a Sabbath day journey away, says Acts 1 verse 12. That's just over a kilometer away. Close enough to still see Jerusalem, but not close enough for the people of Jerusalem to see them. The Lord chooses a private place to part ways with his disciples. The ascension happens in private. That's not because the Lord did not want people to know about it. He did. But he wanted people to hear about it from his apostles. He wanted people to take their word for it. The Lord shows that from now on, his people have to live not by sight, but by faith alone. The ascension, too, is to be an article of faith. But there's more to it than that. In the past, the blessing was to be given in the temple in Jerusalem. After all, that's where the sacrifice was brought. But Christ's sacrifice was not brought in Jerusalem. He was led out of Jerusalem, outside the city gate, rejected by God's people and rejected by God himself. It reminds you a little bit of the Day of Atonement, which we read about in Leviticus 16. Do you remember what happened on the Day of Atonement? The high priest would place his hands on the head of a goat and he would confess all the sins of Israel and place those sins on the goat's head. And then the goat would be led away out of the camp, away from the people, carrying away their sins. And that's what Christ did. He took upon himself the sins of God's people and he carried them away outside the city. So his sacrifice happened outside the holy city. And it began at the Mount of Olives. The last time that Jesus had walked the road from Jerusalem to the Mount of Olives was on the night when he was betrayed. We read that in Luke 22, verse 39. After Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, he led his disciples out to the Mount of Olives to the Garden of Gethsemane. And there he began to feel the weight of God's wrath against sin. And his sacrificial blood began to flow when his sweat became like drops of blood falling on the ground. But now the sacrifice is finished. Sin has been atoned for. There is peace between God and his people. And so the place of sacrifice becomes a place of blessing. And so the Lord Jesus raises his hands. He performs the role of a priest, but not in the temple, not by the altar, because he's not a priest after the order of Aaron. He's much greater than the priests of the temple. They had to give daily sacrifices and daily blessings because the people kept coming back with more sins that had to be atoned for. Christ offered only one sacrifice. He atoned for sins once for all. It never needs to be repeated. And therefore, too, Christ gave only one blessing. The blessing never runs out. The letter to the Hebrews says that Jesus was a priest not after the order of Aaron, but after the order of Melchizedek. You remember Melchizedek way back in Genesis 14 in the days of Abraham. After Abraham had rescued his nephew Lot from invading armies, Abraham was on his way home 
And he passed by the city of Jerusalem, or Salem, as it was known in those days. And what do we read? We read that Melchizedek, who was the king of Salem and also the priest of God Most High, came out of the city. And he blessed Abram outside the city. So Christ here follows the pattern of Melchizedek. Then our text says that as he was blessing them, he was parted from them. That too is something different. In the temple in Jerusalem, the priest stayed, and it was the people who went away. But here it is the priest who goes away. Yet notice where he goes. It says that he was carried up into heaven, the place where God dwells. That is to say, he went into God's eternal dwelling, the most holy place of all. The temple in Jerusalem was a temporary place with temporary offerings and with barriers between God and his people. But Christ accomplishes much more. The doors of heaven go open for him. He opens the way to the heavenly temple, the heavenly Zion, of which the temple is only a shadow. And as he goes to the heavenly temple, the Lord blesses his disciples. It gives new meaning to the words of Psalm 134, verse 3. The Lord bless you from Zion, from the heavenly Zion. And how do the disciples respond? Our text says that they worshipped him. The word means that they fell to the ground and prostrated themselves in worship. They were overwhelmed by what the Lord Jesus had just done. He had ascended into heaven. That is a confession that calls us to worship too. Psalm 134 gives a beautiful perspective on worship. The priests are told to lift up their hands, not to bless the people, but to bless the Lord. Did you notice that in Psalm 134, verse 2? Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. You see, in Bible times, people would raise their hands in praise and in prayer. Think of what we read in Psalm 141. Let my prayer be set before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Or think of the way that the book of praise has translated Psalm 134. Your hands in prayer and worship raise. Adore him in his holy place. The priest lifted his hands to heaven to symbolize that he was lifting the prayers of the people up before God's throne. But what happens then? The priests then respond with stanza three of Psalm 134. The Lord now bless you from above, from Zion in his boundless love. And so the outstretched hands of the priest, which have raised the prayers up to God, are now filled with God's blessing, which he places upon the people. That's worship, brothers and sisters. The Lord receives our praises and our prayers, and he responds with his blessing. That gives joy. And so we also read that the disciples returned to Jerusalem with great joy. They were continually in the temple blessing God. Now then you might wonder, why did they return to Jerusalem? To the temple of all places. Isn't that the wrong place? Hadn't Christ just led them away from there? Well, first of all, I'd like you to notice that the gospel of Luke has come full circle. Luke's gospel begins in the temple, and it ends in the temple. It begins with Zechariah, the priest after the order of Aaron, who comes out of the holy place to bless the people. But Zechariah can't get the words out because the angel has struck him dumb. The blessing of the priesthood of Aaron fails. 
Luke's gospel ends with the ascending Christ, priest after the order of Melchizedek, who comes out of Jerusalem to bless his disciples. It begins with Simeon and Anna in the temple, praising God because Jesus has come down from the Father. And it ends with the disciples in the temple, praising God because Jesus has gone back to the Father. Secondly, I'd like you to notice that Christ himself had told the disciples to return to Jerusalem. We read that in verse 49. Stay in the city of Jerusalem, he said, until you are clothed with power from on high. They had to wait there for the Holy Spirit to come upon them. Once the Holy Spirit came, they could begin to preach. First in Jerusalem, and then out from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. In the Old Testament age, all roads led to Jerusalem. The people had to go there. But in the New Testament age, all roads lead out of Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. Luke's gospel ends with a small group of disciples worshiping God in the temple. But only 10 days later at Pentecost, there are already 3,000 more. Then Acts 6 verse 7 tells us that a large number of priests became Christians. In Acts 8, the church spreads out to Samaria. And then in Acts 10, it begins to go to the Gentiles until it reaches all the way to Rome. And since that time, it has spread much further still all over the world, also to us here in Hamilton. Now that's not surprising. After all, the Old Testament already has that global perspective. Look at the way that Psalm 134 ends. The Lord who made heaven and earth bless you from Zion. The God who blesses us is not a local God, the God of Jerusalem, but he is the God of heaven and earth. And in the New Testament, we see that blessing going out from Zion progressively further to the ends of the earth. How does that work? How does the blessing travel? Well, the blessing of Christ was first received by a small group of apostles. But those apostles went out preaching the gospel as they went. And wherever they went, churches sprang up. And from those churches came other churches all over the world. And in each of those churches, worship services are held and the blessing is given. Servants of Christ in every place lift up their hand and lay the blessing upon the church. And so the entire church receives the blessing. The one holy Catholic church stands under the outstretched arms of the ascended high priest, Jesus Christ. And we, brothers and sisters, we all as priests stretch out our hands to receive the blessing with joy and with longing. We are a kingdom of priests after all, and priests belong in the temple. Our high priest is already there in God's holy presence, and he's preparing a place for us there so that one day we may be with him there in the presence of the Father, the most holy place, and may see our God face to face. That day is coming. We know it's coming because already today God gives his blessing. Tonight we stand again under the outstretched arms of our high priest Jesus Christ who blesses us on our way. And that blessing never fails. The Lord will bless you even when you experience hardship and difficulties. He will show you his goodness and his care. The Lord will keep you also in times of danger. He will surround you with his shelter and protection, and he'll be gracious to you. And when your path seems dark with worry and stress, when grief and sorrow close in around you, the Lord will lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Receive his blessing. 
Hold on to it in faith. Take it home with you. Rejoice in the Lord who never fails you. Bless the Lord, because the Lord who blesses you will also come again. Come, Lord Jesus. Maranatha. Amen. Let's now sing together hymn number 42, and we'll do so standing, and after we've sung that hymn, please remain standing for the Apostles' Creed. Brothers and sisters, please uh, join your voices to mine and let's recite the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, he descended into hell. On the third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe the Holy Catholic Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated.
Let's join together in prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You now have an opportunity to bring your offerings of thankfulness before the Lord. And after your gifts have been received, we'll sing as our closing song, hymn number 41, the three stanzas of hymn 41.
Receive now the blessing of your ascended high priest and go your way with his peace upon your hearts. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.